Hey, 4C Divers! Thank you for tuning in. We are super excited. We have a fantastic presentation tonight. Um, but before we start that presentation, let's check in and say hello to everybody. If you don't know my name, my name is Nicole. I'm your social media director here at 4C. And uh, we have, for the month of March, the theme is Sea Turtle Month. So what we do, guys, is we like to celebrate sea turtles by doing presentations, uh, dives, classes, sea, um, and also fundraisers to talk about sea turtles and help sea turtle conservation and research. So uh, tonight is going to be a presentation about sea turtle research with the people over at the In Water Research Group. Uh, we've got Cody Mott. Say hello to Cody. Everyone say hi. There we go. We got people tuning in. Excellent. So if you guys are tuning in, please let us know where you're um, listening in from. We like to know if you're here locally or if you're from out of the state, even out of the country. So say hello to us. And if you ever have any questions throughout the presentation, write them into that comment section and we will get them answered. Uh, you guys know the drill. If you're having a good time, you like this presentation, give us that thumbs up that heart emoji or that smiley face uh, to let us know you're enjoying tonight's presentation. Uh, and if you did not register online, uh, you know the drill. Go over to our website, www.forstashy.com. Find tonight's presentation. Click on it. You want to register on Eventbrite because that gives me access to your name and your email. And then I put you in a random name picker. And at the end of the night, we're going to be raffling off a couple of things. I'm going to raffle off two 4C sea turtle t-shirts. So if you go into any 4C store and if it's a t-shirt with a sea turtle on it that says 4C, uh, pick out your size and you are the winner. So we'll do that after the presentation. All right, there they all are. They're all saying hello. Awesome. Thanks guys for tuning in. We've got a great presentation about sea turtles. Um, before we start though, uh, I wanted to make an announcement. We are celebrating our one year anniversary of our Boynton Beach 4C Scuba Center. So we are going to have a party this Saturday, the 18th, March 18th, um, from 1 to 4 p.m. Uh, come on down to the store and we're going to have live music. We're going to have um, food. We're going to have drinks and uh, we're going to have a sale. So a lot of stuff um, that wouldn't be on sale. We're going to put on sale that day for that day only. And we're going to have a raffle where we have a GoPro. We have a zookeeper. We have hot sauces from Spicy Shark. We have JBL pool spears. We've got boat passes from our local boat operators. All types of stuff is going to be raffled off in the at the party. So you want to make sure you come down and check that out. Come see our store if you haven't come. Uh, but we're celebrating our one year since we opened that location. And we're super excited to service the Boynton Beach area. Uh, if the ocean is not rough, then go and dive that morning. Catch some fish and bring it and we'll cook it up for you. We're going to be doing fish tacos at the party. So... Uh, if you bring in fish, we'll give you extra raffle tickets uh, for your fish because we want to be able to uh, have enough fish to share with everyone. So, guys, um, I'm going to go ahead and let Cody take over. Uh, he's going to tell you more about his research group, who he is, and what they're doing here in the local South Florida area to help with sea turtles. All right. Thanks, Nicole. Um, thank you guys all for, for coming tonight and spending some time with us to learn more about sea turtles and what we're doing at InWater Research. Um, again, my name is Cody Mott. I'm a biologist with InWater Research Group. Our primary focus is actually sea turtles and working with them in the water. And there are some challenges with working with, with sea turtles in the water because, you know, that's where they live, spend 99% of their time. But um, that's where it's hardest to access them. And as any of you have encountered sea turtles in the ocean, they're a little faster than uh, you might think they might be. And so it takes a lot of work and boats and effort and, and time to go ahead and, and see and research turtles um, in their, their habitat they spend most of their time in. And so since I'm talking to a bunch of divers, we pulled up a couple of pictures really quick of me and kind of my background in diving. Uh, you'll see the 4C Reynolds tank on my back there on, on that uh, wreck dive. Started diving when I was 13, actually down in Boca. Um, and we dove a lot with uh, Captain Tony in the diversity. Um, and I come down every summer from Pennsylvania from where I'm from, come down there, spend two weeks, dive as much as I physically could, um, then go back to Pennsylvania and, and dream about it for the next 
50 uh, weeks until I come back down. I uh, moved down here um, to be a marine biology student when I was 18, go to FAU, and then continue diving through that. I just went back and looked at these pictures, and I'm looking at the kind of the, the snorkel with the purge valve I have there and that gigantic knife on my calf on, on that picture and that wreck dive. And now things have changed a little bit. I'm, I'm just throwing my free dive fins on and uh, my free dive uh, snorkel. And so things have, things have changed in my gear in, in the last 20 years, but I'm still enjoying diving uh, here in South Florida. Um, and so to get into the sea turtles a little bit and kind of give you a little bit of history of, of sea turtles in Florida, um, this guy by the name of uh, William T. Sherman during the Civil War actually wrote about how many sea turtles there were in Florida. He says he does not recall a place in all his experience on earth where fish, oysters, and green turtles specifically so abound as Fort Pierce, Florida. So that's just a little bit north of where the dive shops are at. But um, you can imagine in the early 1800s and mid 1800s, how many sea turtles there were. He actually said that his his soldiers got tired of eating sea turtle and were just hoping to eat some, some, Florida, some Florida beef, which was actually harder to find at that point. By the late 1800s into the early 1900s, the commercial sea turtle fishery uh, here in Florida had basically fished most of the turtles out of local waters. By uh, 1900s, there was actually a cold stun and a lot of turtles died then. Um, and most of those turtles at that point were already fished out of, of local water. So these turtles were being harvested primarily for their meat and their fat to make um, soup. And they were taken um, aboard steam, steamer boats um, from here in Florida and then shipped up the East Coast uh, to canneries primarily. And one area that if you guys ever get down to the Florida Keys, the Key West Turtle Crawls, um, this is actually, there is the Turtle Crawl Bar, I believe, still open down there. And it is the site of the historical Turtle Crawl or Pen where fishermen used to bring in their green turtles uh, after their harvest. And in the... Um, in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, it was actually a tourist attraction, kind of a roadside attraction. And actually, by that time, the fit or the turtles that were being landed in Key West weren't coming from Florida waters. They were actually Canadian fishermen that would sail the whole way to Nicaragua, pick up turtles there, catch them in Nicaraguan waters, and then sail them back up to the U.S. to um, market. Um, so basically, at this point green turtles were what we call functionally extinct from Florida waters. There weren't enough that they were reproducing. Uh, there were few left. And so in the 1960s, um, some scientists had this great idea that they called Operation Green Turtle because it was in conjunction with the Navy. So it had to have an operational name um, where they moved green turtle hatchlings from Costa Rica, where there still were a lot of little green turtles. And they moved them um, and dispersed them to 17 different countries around the Caribbean. So they put them in these like banana boxes, um, take these hatchlings and they drop them off all over the Caribbean, hoping that they would get bigger. Um, it was discontinued um, when the Vietnam War kind of really started ramping up. Um, the military needed those aircraft and, and those finances to do other things. And basically because at this time, scientists thought that green turtles only took six years to reach sexual maturity. And so they weren't seeing any results. So they said, yeah, this isn't working. And they really didn't know what was going on. So they canceled it. Um, and then from there, Florida actually picked up a Head Start program. So in the 1970s is what they would do is collect eggs from green turtle nests from the very few that were found. Um, there were just a, a handful at that time. They'd incubate them in a styrofoam container um, at what that point I think was Florida Department of Natural Resources, if I get it right, um, before it was FWC, um, in one of their offices. And then they would raise them um in a facility for up to a year so they got to what we call about dinner plate size so you can see some people here um there's some releasing some green turtles into the uh into this is the indian river lagoon um and i think this is actually the founder um eleanor fletcher of bloggerhead marine life center releasing some little greens as well and so in that time in that 16 or 17 years they raised eighteen thousand green turtles and released them successfully um by the end of the program, 150 turtles had been found in other spots um, all around the Caribbean. And 80% of those turtles had been found live. Um, they had been found up as far north as New York, across the Atlantic, off the Azor Islands, Africa, and Brazil. So some of these turtles were being were successful and were, were making their way out into the ocean. Uh, however, there were no adults that were ever found. So at this point, um, FWC said, listen, we can't continue this. 
Um, we don't think it's being successful. We're not finding any adults. Um, and we're just going to have to wait and see what happens and try other conservation me measures. So it wasn't until 2002 that the first adult was ever encountered back in Florida. This turtle was tagged PPG 413. It was released uh, in June of 1987 from Jensen Beach um, at 4.1 kilograms. So that weighs about eight to nine pounds. Um, it was recaptured um, later than in 2002, um, almost um, the same date that it was released at the St. Lucie power plant on Hutchinson Island, which is actually in Jensen Beach. It's only about three or four miles away. Um, and at this point, it weighed um, just under 100 kilograms, so over 200 pounds. So it wasn't until, until years year, and years later that we ever had any adults come back. And since that time, there have been at least five other turtles that have been countered that were originally head started and found either nesting on the beach or there's actually another male here. And it's kind of interesting that how are you finding a male on a nesting beach? Only the females come up. Well, green turtle males are notorious for being very uh, persistent, I should say. And they were, he was still attached to the female um, from mating as she decided to come up and lay her eggs. So as they were coming out of the surf, he fell off and uh, flipped over. And some very lucky sea turtle biologist happened to encounter that male and were able to find that tag from a turtle that had been tagged um, like 20 years beforehand. So because of these measures, um, this head starting, we think a little bit and some of the other conservation measures, you can see the green turtle nesting in the state of Florida has risen exponentially um, since those, those last, last efforts were put in place to head start turtles. And so it's a very successful story so far um, to see these numbers increase so quickly. Um, you'll notice on the, uh, the graph, this is per year, and this is not the total number of nests, but it gives you an idea. This is, means these are beaches that are consistently monitored the same way from 1989 through, through currently um, to, to see the trend over this extended period that the turtles, um, the green turtle nest, nesting numbers are, are rising really, really rapidly. And we're really excited about that. And you may notice that some of these, you'll get like a high and then a low year. And that's um, expected because sea turtles don't nest every year. They nest every two to three years. So it takes a lot of energy from these adult turtles to migrate from wherever they're foraging. Again, it could be Nicaragua, it could be the Caribbean, it could be um, somewhere over the Bahamas to make that journey and lay um, hundreds to thousands of eggs uh, during a nesting season. So they don't come back and lay every year, it's every two to three years. And that's why you see that, that kind of jump up and down in nesting. So what exactly happens to these little green turtles after they leave our beaches? So great. We have these successful little hatchlings and they make their way down to the sand, um, hatch out of the nest, make their way down the beach on the sand, and then go ahead and enter the open ocean. And when they get out to the open ocean, they're going to swim for two to three days till they reach um, the, the Gulf Stream where they are associated with sargassum um, algae. And I think you, there's a lot of news stories out right now about this giant sargassum bloom um, down in the the lower Caribbean and kind of almost into the South Atlantic that's heading this way. And so this algae floats at the surface and it creates an entire habitat or ecosystem for these turtles and other fish and other animals um, that associate with it. It's, it gives them cover, it gives them safety, they can find food, eat shrimp and other little organisms that they find in the, in the, um, in the sargassum. And so they live out there for two to three years before they decide that they are going to then make a journey out of the open ocean and into near shore habitats um, such as those here in Florida. So one area are what we call our near shore hard bottom reefs. This is the very first reef, um, usually along Florida's uh, southeast coast. Uh, it's typically in eight to 15 feet of water, um, something that you would typically snorkel. You might not dive it as much, um, but it is part of that same reef track to the, those deeper dives. And there they're eating primarily um, algae that they find on that reef. Um, other green turtles will, will recruit or find habitat to, to hang out into in seagrass beds. So a lot of these are in our lagoons um, and shallow coastal waters, especially down in the Florida Keys. And so that's where we as in water group, in water research group studies a lot of these, these turtles. Um, and so we have study sites. We primarily focus here in Florida, but we will work with sea turtles all over the southeast um, 
Uh, we have had some sites during the BP oil spill in Alabama and Louisiana and a partner with people in Georgia and the Carolinas as well. But we're talking about some sites where we encounter green turtles and some of the, the big picture things that we've learned about these turtles that are inhabiting these habitats. So I'm going to start you off here uh, in the Key West National Wildlife Refuge. And one of the ways that we capture these turtles um, isn't typically by diving, but is by a method we call rodeo. So once we find a turtle, uh, we'll go ahead and we'll actively pursue the turtle with the, our boat. We run shallow water boats until we're able to tire the turtle out a little bit and then confidently go ahead and see if we can catch the turtle. Um, it's really interesting because this looks uh, pretty invasive, but it's actually the least stressful way to capture turtles. Um, and it actually prevents us from setting nets or disturbing the, the bottom and any of the habitat that they're associated with too. So we'll go ahead and bring them to the surface this way. So the Key West National Wildlife Refuge is one of our longest running uh, study sites. Most of this is loggerhead turtles in this video. I, I will mention that um, in case somebody's like, no, you don't even know your turtle species, but um, those are loggerheads. But this is a, just a good video of showing us how we're able to, to rodeo these animals. Um, we've done some stress hormone research and show actually that, again, this is the least stressful way to catch turtles. Um, turtles are pretty accustomed to a large animal pursuing them, a predator like a shark, and they are really good at, at dealing with that stress. It's actually less stressful than us holding an animal in a tank for like a, for like rehabilitation for an extended period of time. So we've been really successful with that. One of the things that we've been able to find down in the Key West National Wildlife Refuge whoop, is some really, really big green turtles. Um, this green turtle here is the largest we've ever caught, clocked in at just 500 pounds. A lot of times if you read the books, they'll say green turtles get up to 350, maybe 400 pounds. Um, we definitely know they get bigger. Um, they just haven't, we haven't been around long enough to, to find some bigger ones. This one was 500 pounds, the biggest we've ever caught on any of our projects. So with this project, we've actually found one of the first foraging habitats for adult green turtles in Florida waters. We know that a lot of our green turtles end up leaving our waters at some point when they get a little bit older and going into the Caribbean, a lot of times into um, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and um, into uh, into Cuba, where they have a much larger threat of being of being captured for food. Um, we were really excited to find out here that we actually had a lot of turtles that are actually staying in Florida waters, at least for a larger portion of their life, and then we're able to go ahead and protect them for longer. Um, moving over to Florida's west coast, or um, the Big Bend region of Florida, so this is north of Tampa, St. Pete, um, and kind of south of Tallahassee, uh, that area. That's about 200 miles of coastline. It's the only portion of Florida that really doesn't have a sandy beach. And so there's no sea turtle nesting in this area. And so for a lot of reasons, it's been neglected um, for sea turtle research. And so we wanted to understand what turtles are doing there. Um, again, no known sea turtle nesting habitat, but there are these really extensive seagrass beds and um, they're really beautiful. If you've ever had a chance to go over there, um, possibly go scalloping. Um, it's, it's a really impressive um, habitat, a different area to check out. Um, and if you ever get a chance to explore that area, it, it's pretty amazing. Um, we know it's sea turtle developmental habitat just based on the type of habitat that's there and some old studies. Um, we know that area because of the seagrass beds is a nursery for fish and invertebrates. We know that there's commercial shellfish uh, operations working out of there. And then also that recreational scallop fishery. And so that habitat um, supports a lot of different endeavors here in Florida. And one of those we thought was, was sea turtles. Okay, now we have another video. This is what we would call kind of a modified uh, way of doing this. Um, we're actually going to use a dip net and we'll point out the green turtle here. It's just, this is a really good way to see all the sponge and um, seagrasses and algae that are, that are in here. Again, we're working in only probably four to five feet of water. You'll see to the top of your screen, we have a little green turtle this time just kind of chilling out, um, staying about as far away as they can from the boat while just kind of keeping a safe eye on us. So we're gonna see if we can go ahead and capture that little green turtle. See some barnacles on its back there, just chilling. We go ahead and dip net and we'll go ahead and bring that turtle to the surface. Now, the great thing about us using a dip net is if we miss, we have another chance. If we jump, we have a diver in the water. 
and we have to go around, turn around and pick up that diver before we can pursue the, tur the turtle. And oftentimes they escape. So this gives us a better chance to get these little green turtles um, in this habitat. Um, and we've been really successful over there at catching these green turtles and trying to understand what's going on there. And one of the surprising things that we found out, uh, there we go, is turtles in, in these habitats and these extensive seagrass beds, which we assumed were very pristine based on just what the habitat looks like, have a disease at a high rate. Um, this is called fiber papillomatosis or FP for short. Um, and it produces these cauliflower like tumors on the turtles, um, typically on the soft tissue. Um, it doesn't kill the animal, but it can be severely debilitating. As you can see in the one picture here, this turtle has a gigantic tumor on its eye. Uh, obviously, it'd be really hard for that animal to find food or to uh, to, to try to escape from predators with, with such a large tumor. Is this, These tumors are associated with a herpes virus um, that's been around as long as turtles have been um, around, basically. Um, it's not a new disease, and the turtles that get this seem to be in waters that are typically um, degraded in some, in some way, like in lagoons, um, where they're their uh, their immune system is suppressed, uh, allowing this virus to um, to kind of show itself. And the same thing if you're sick, if you're run if you're run down, um, and you're stressed, there's a better chance that you catch in a cold or a virus as well. And it's the same with these turtles. And so we know in some areas of Florida, 100% of green turtles and lagoons actually are exposed to the virus and get it. It's just whether then that they are able to beat the disease and that it. it um, it goes at, they go ahead and survive or that unfortunately they pass away. So we were really surprised to see that 72% of the green turtles that we encounter over in the Big Bend region have that disease, whereas some more degraded areas such as the Indian River Lagoon, um, Fort Pierce in the Lagoon and Lake Worth Lagoon have slightly lower um, levels. Key West National Wildlife Refuge, we're working down there with those bigger turtles. Only about 8% of those turtles actually have the disease. So well, generally the turtles are fat and happy. They do have a high rate of this disease and we're still trying to figure out why that is and what stressors may be causing the turtles um, to, uh, to, to have that um, level of tumors. And one of the things we're really excited about at that study site is that Florida has passed a new aquatic preserve area, basically between uh, from Citrus County down to uh, through Pasco County. This is the Nature Coast Aquatic Preserve, which helps protect these submerged habitats, um, primarily these seagrass beds that are off of this area. So we're really excited that there's going to be some more protection for these habitats, hopefully help with water quality, and then also protect um, sea turtles as well. Uh, moving a little bit closer um, to, to where we are all at is one of our, our longer term studies in Lake Worth Lagoon. We operate near Little Money and Island, which if you're all familiar with uh, Phil Foster Park and the Blue Heron Bridge, um, that's just we're working just to the north. So we actually launch out of Phil Foster Park usually um, and Peanut Island here in Lake Worth Inlet uh, just a little bit to the south. So we've been working in that area for about 20 years now. Uh, we've done a combination of this rodeo and dip net rodeo and um, even some netting to catch turtles there. We try not to use netting as much as possible because of bycatch. Um, we don't want to catch manatees or dolphins um, or, or sharks or rays. It just makes it a lot more of a challenge for everybody. Um, so we've been working there for a while, uh, looking at the trends in sea turtle health and size in that area. Uh, but we've also been doing genetics. So we want to know where these turtles are coming from, where are their natal beaches, where have these turtles been, were they born that are hanging out? And you might think that many of our turtles are, are locals, but they're not. And we're finding that somewhere between 30% of, around 30% of the turtles we catch in Lake Worth Lagoon are from Costa Rica, about another 30% come from Mexico, um, and then 10 to 15% um, each from South Florida and Central Florida, and then a mix from all around the Caribbean, um, and then even some from North, Northern Brazil. So as what this means is our Florida turtles that we're encountering locally don't necessarily mean that they're coming um, from Florida beaches. And so we have a very international group of sea turtles hanging out um, in our waters. And that kind of makes sense if they're, if they're hanging out in currents that move throughout the Caribbean. Um, as they grow, they kind of drop out of those currents and find habitat um, close by. 
And so um, something to think about, again, is our sea turtles are, are more international um, than local and protecting them here is very important, but also protecting them um, throughout the Caribbean and the North Atlantic is also very important. Um, and then another local site, and this one is Du Bois Park uh, up in Jupiter, near the Jupiter Inlet. Uh, this is our research boat. It gives you a little better idea of how we do this. We have our captain at the center, two observers at the top, and then usually a jumper or diver at the, surf at the bow of the boat um, with somebody assisting. And that's how we're going to go ahead and do our rodeo or our dip net rodeo. And so actually, the, once we see a turtle, the observers at the top actually take over the, uh, the driving because they have a much better view of the turtles. And so what we found um, here, and this is, I'm going to kind of zoom in. If this is the Jupiter, if you can see my arrow, the Jupiter Bridge um, over US Federal Highway 1, which has just got closed down for a while. Um, this is the inlet, Cato's Bridge to the north. And right beside Du Bois Park, we're going to zoom in to this area. It's about three acres uh, between um, between these areas here, between uh, between the park and some of the first boat docks, um, is where we encounter the majority of our turtles. Um, somebody actually labeled this turtle town. This site is really interesting because sea turtles here behave a lot differently than our turtles at our other sites. Because they are adjacent to the inlet, they're accustomed to the boat noise and boat traffic. Uh, because so many people paddleboard and snorkel this area, they're accustomed to people. And so when they encounter us on the boat, it's actually, they don't move or spook very easily. And so and it's actually a little bit harder to net them because they don't have any momentum that um, kind of pushes them into the net. When you dip net them, they can kind of turn and, and spin quickly. So we've had to kind of change our methodology of catching turtles here. Uh, but it, the really interesting part is that we're getting a lot of recaptures. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the next slide, hopefully. There we go. And so here's a little zoom in of our, our study site here. And this is the inlet and the park again. And then our study site just right here beside Du Bois Park. These little dots represent um, the captures of a single green turtle over a two year period. And so we've gone back multiple times and that turtle is staying in a very close location. Um, they like to hang out right there. So because of that, we've been able to get a lot of um, morphometric information, how fast they're growing, um, how fat they're kind of getting and get some health data over that as well. So we're tagging all these turtles. You can actually see on here that we have flipper tags. We also put in a microchip, just like your cat or dog has, so that we can track their growth and their behavior over an extended period of time. We've actually had a few turtles that we've caught um, that were doing really well. And then on their last capture, we noticed maybe they're a little skinnier than we thought. We could go back to that data, say, hey, something might be wrong with this turtle, and then send it to rehab um, with FWC um, as permission, and that way they can see if they maybe have ingested a hook or, or, or sick for whatever reason. So this site uh, is one of our newer sites. We've only been there since, I think, 2017, 2018, um, but it's providing a lot of data um, on what these turtles are doing and what they're eating. Um, so we're really excited to continue that project. So if you guys dive out of Jupiter and see your boat there, we see the, the dive boats coming in and out the inlet all the time. Give us a wave. Um, and the last site here I want to talk about a little bit is that near shore reef. Um, and this, this site is really interesting to me for a bunch of reasons. One of the reasons um, is it's actually part of my PhD project. I'm a, I'm a PhD candidate at FAU. I decided to go back to school again um, to continue studying sea turtles and understand a little bit more about them. And so on that near shore reef, uh, we're trying to understand what green turtles are doing. And we know that they should be eating algae at this age. They're primarily herbivores, uh, but that's not always the case. And we're finding that, especially here um, in the South Florida reefs, that that definitely is not the case. And so one of the places that I'm really interested in is the Deerfield Beach International Fishing Pier, um, which is just south of the Boca Raton in Inlet. It actually has the highest documented number of hooked green turtles um, in the state of Florida. Um, and part of that is because that pier uh, it basically runs through the near shore reef. And if you can see on this picture a little bit, those dark areas, that's some of that reef that's a little bit different than the sand around it. 
And so basically this pier runs through green turtle habitat and they're getting hooked and we kind of want to know why. Um, and why we picked this site is one, um, I've been diving here for a while. Uh, two, it has a stable near shore reef. Um, and we've had a partnership with a rehab facility, the Gumbo Limbo Nature Center, um, which responds typically to the turtles that are hooked on that pier. So they have a really great relationship with the pier um, and make sure that those turtles that do get hooked are, are kind of pulled up by the fishermen safely uh, with a net and they can go to rehab for um, some help. Um, that was the plan. Um, I don't know if any of you guys uh, have gone and done your PhD, but the moment that you say that you're going back to school to do a project, uh, everything turns upside down. So the near shore reef that was once stable hasn't been stable. It got covered up by sand last summer. Um, and then we're about the, the cities of Boca and Deerfield and, and the counties are about to re-nourish that entire beach. So they're going to dredge and pump more sand onto the beach to make it wider, which is great over the long term for sea turtle nesting. Um, not so great all the time because you're just, you may significantly cover that reef over the short term. So that, that's been tough. And then this week, um, the Gumbo Limbo Nature Center rehab facility shut down. Um, and so that's extremely unfortunate. Um, all of the, the great staff that were working there, that were working with me in, the, in these relationships um, were actually fired and so that's 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 really tough um and so we're trying to kind of scramble to see what's going to happen and how we're going to be able to, to continue this this project without the support of of the gumbo limbo rehab team um i know there's a lot coming out right now about what's going on at gumbo limbo and a lot of news stories and things like that i i know for a fact um, i'll just kind of drop this here that uh FWC, in all my experience, does not send sea turtles on vacation to other facilities. Um, that's not something that they typically would ever do and definitely wouldn't call it vacation. Um, and so that's not how any of that operates, uh, unfortunately. So I, I know that Gumbo Limbo right now doesn't have any turtles because they, they don't have a turtle program um, for, for rehab turtles right now. So hopefully that gets taken care of, but um, that's gonna be a long-term thing that's gonna need a lot of fixing. Um, but in the meantime, we're going to try to go ahead and keep this going. Um, and so one of those turtles that was at Gumbo Limbo with this great partnership um, was a turtle card wormhole. Um, and you can see on this radiograph here that this turtle actually has a circle hook ingested. Um, and then another case has some fishing line wrapped around one of its front flippers. So wormhole was caught at the fishing pier four times in a year. Um, and then on its Fifth or it's after its fourth capture and being uh, being successfully rehabbed, it was relocated 85 miles to the north and to, inside the Fort Pierce Inlet, um, an area called Round Island, actually in the lagoon. Uh, and then that turtle traveled 85 miles back within two months, back down to the reef where it was a, near the Deerfield Pier, and then was hooked again in 2021. So um, in this meantime, in this, the 2000s, um, the pier was actually shut down for COVID. So um, there weren't as many chances for it to get hooked, but it got hooked uh, a fifth time. And so what is so great or what's so special about the Deerfield Pier that causes a turtle to swim 85 miles from where it was, swims through all different kinds of great habitat um, that it could have possibly hung out and ate seagrass and algae um, and passed some other piers that were down the coast. Um, and we know, we think, at least we hypothesize that these turtles are attracted to the fishing hooks. And that's what we're trying to figure out. And the bait that's on those hooks, we're trying to understand exactly what attracts them and why they're getting caught so frequently. And so these green turtles are supposed to be herbivorous, right? They're supposed to eat seagrasses and algae at this size. But in this case, some of these green turtles aren't. So if you're a little green turtle and you have the choice or the ability to eat the salad or eat the steak and your goal in life is to get bigger, faster, stronger, uh, one way to do that is to eat the steak. And so we know that green turtles, um, a lot of research has come out in the last few years, shows that these turtles aren't necessarily herbivores completely and are more omnivorous sometimes at this stage. Um, and so that when they have an opportunity to eat a high protein diet and kind of bulk up and get bigger and faster, they're gonna go ahead and give it a shot. Um, and sometimes to their own demise. So one of the things we're trying to do um, is understand and compare how these turtles caught on this fishing pier compared to other turtles caught on the reef around it. So we're looking at their home range, basically how much of the reef they use, does it overlap, um, 
and figure that out. So one of the ways we're doing that is with the support of the National Save the Sea Turtle Foundation. Um, somebody uh, you may know, Larry Wood um, with the Florida Hawksville Project. He's also associated with them. Um, and some groups, uh, the Ocean Tracking Network and Innova Seas. So they provide um, these acoustic receivers, um, which we go ahead and place in different places along the seafloor that allows us to track the positions of the turtle. So basically is what we'll do is we'll put a tag on the turtle and it pings every so often um, these receivers to alert on its location. One second. And so here you can see actually on the left, myself diving to replace one of these receivers. So um, take a good look at this. They're, we are not the only people that use this setup. You may see one some other reefs, a lot of shark and fish people use them as well. Uh, you may see a piece of PVC or a pipe sticking out of the ground. Um, and at the top, there's a little uh, kind of like uh, knob at the top, it usually sticks out of whatever it's put in. Um, and that is what is receiving those acoustic signals. And so we secure those to the ocean floor in a, in a different, couple of different ways. Our way typically is on sand. So we put a concrete block, the PVC um, riser, and then secure it through there. So if you, you see something like that, that's actually probably part of some scientific study. Um, it's hard to actually write, you know, hey, this is, you know, property of X, Y, and Z because it all gets biofiled pretty darn quickly out there. Um, and so if you look at the map, we go ahead and we have the pier here at the center and we set out a bunch of these acoustic receivers kind of in a grid pattern and they're spaced about 400 meters apart. And is what that allows us to do is tag the turtle and as it moves through the receiver array or along that reef, it sends its signal to multiple receivers at the same time. We can triangulate its position and get an actual GPS position of where that turtle is underwater um, in its movement. So that way we can actually um, find out what these turtles are doing and where they're going. Um, and again, we can track its movement through the area. So along with all of the research we do, um, if we don't get this information out to people um, and tell them what we're doing and how we're doing it and why we need to conserve sea turtles and, and, and protect our local waters, um, it's all for naught. And so one of the programs we've been doing is through our, our educational initiatives. This is actually a group of K through 12 teachers that we've brought out into the field for half a day. This is our Jupiter site. Um, they're all on a boat. And we've been able to show them firsthand what we're doing with sea turtles and how the, all the conservation works. And then for the second half of the day, we teach them how to run through our educational programs that they can bring into their classroom. And so those, cla those, those programs are pretty intensive, but what you can see here, um, this is a picture of myself and my colleague Ness working up a, a little green turtle on one of those trips, and then some teachers doing the same thing, the same sets of calipers, same similar data sheets, and we use turtle models in these cases um, to replicate the real things. And then that gets passed on to school, school groups. So this is our traveling turtles program. It's absolutely free. None of our education programs come at any cost. Uh, we wanna make sure that's eliminated. And so every student has an opportunity to get these in their classroom. It's four lesson modules. It takes about three weeks, really, if a teacher runs through the whole thing. It's based on state standards and, and STEM curriculum and really gives the students an opportunity to um, do exactly what we do in the classroom. And you can actually see some of the turtles, students with our new model turtles. These are actually based off a turtle we caught at Jupiter Inlet. We took a ton of photos and measurements. It was turned into a 3D model that was then produced so that they have a more accurate green turtle that they can use in the classroom, taking the same measurements that we do. I um, really get that realistic um, feel for these students um, to participate in our education initiatives. Um, so with that, um, I would let, encourage you guys, if you liked what you heard tonight or want to hear more about us, to check out our website, inwater.org. Uh, we're also pretty active on social media, primarily Facebook and Instagram. Uh, we can be found there easily, just type in our name. Um, we do post again on Instagram and Facebook kind of more frequently about the different projects we have and the, the cool things that we encounter there. So with that, um, here, I'll just leave you with a quick clip um, of a little green turtle hanging out on the Deerfield Pier Cam, which if you haven't checked that out, type go on YouTube and type in Deerfield Beach uh, Pier Camera and this little green turtle just kind of chilling out and checking out the, uh, the camera there. Um, which I thought was pretty darn cool.
He seems suspicious, to be honest with you. All right, so I am going to go ahead and stop sharing. All right. Awesome. That's so funny that you have the video of the, the peer uh, cam because today I was actually standing in the store and one of my colleagues, um, they're like, oh my gosh, look at the peer camera because we had it streaming. Mm -hmm. And we had a little green sea turtle today, this morning. He was that hanging out or she, he, she, who knows, uh, at the pier. So that's they're awesome. Yeah, there. <laughs> they're still there, which, which is good. So I have to go out and see if we can catch some more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, just because, you know, a lot of us, we're underwater with these um, animals or maybe we're snorkeling or we're from the shore. Um, what are the laws about being around these animals in the water? Okay, that, that, that's a great question. So like as sea turtle numbers come up, this is something that's going to happen more frequently. You're going to encounter them. So the, the, the basic thing is you're not allowed to harass them, right? Don't chase them. Don't pursue them. If you see one in the water, great. Just watch. Just observe, you know. Be the fish you are on, on the reef like every other fish um, when you're diving. Just, you know, you can follow them. And during nesting season, there's going to be a lot of turtles sleeping on the reef. Let them alone. Um, I know occasionally some good some good divers can have a really good camera, can get a get a picture of a tag, and we can really zoom in, which is which is great and beneficial if, if you don't harass the animal. Um, kind of the, the thing we like to say is most turtles are, are, are healthy. They're doing their thing. If they look sick or injured, um, normally you can't. Um, that's when you could you, you could catch them, right? Like if, if you can catch one, there's probably something wrong with it, mm -hmm. um, and that needs to be called into Florida Fish and Wildlife. And I think it's one eight eight four zero four FWCC is the the general wildlife hotline for all animals in Florida, so or wildlife in Florida. So call that. That'll send go to a dispatcher, and then they'll get you the help that you need. Um, so that is, that is really what to do on the beach. Same thing. Just leave them alone. If you have an opportunity to do a sea turtle walk on the beach, um, with any of the local organizations, that's great. Um, definitely do that. You have a much better chance of, of seeing them, but yeah, kind of just observe just like all the other animals that, um, you encounter out there. Awesome. Um, so you brought up the uh, Deerfield area, that project that you guys are doing, and uh, it looks like they're going to start doing renourishment um, in April. Um, is that a set in stone project or is that something that we as divers can go to a meeting, uh, uh, like a, a town meeting to kind of give our two cents about what we feel about this? Yeah. So that's so. So beach renourishment's Tough. You 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 can, but the, the, it's going to happen now. Like it's it's set in stone. The the, the dredge is on its way. That's okay. and it's, it's it's going to happen. Um, and that's something that has to happen, right? Because historically, the the barrier islands where all the condos are built geologically move. They shift with changing changing conditions in the ocean with sea height or with the ocean's height. All of that. Um, we've literally drawn a line in the sand, put A1A down that. And so that that island can't move and adjust. So that's what happens. And that's why you get that beach erosion um, and to protect the property that's there, but also the nesting beaches and the, the beaches for, for, for tourists, they have to bring sand in and, and pump it on those beaches. That sand typically runs kind of moves south from north, you know, south from, you know, Jacksonville the whole way down. But those inlets kind of rob the sand and take it in. So they have to pump it out of the inlets and then continue its flow southward and some of it offshore to kind of help as well. Um, so it does net benefit turtles if it's done correctly. Um, if they get the right sand grain quality and, and, and size, um, that will help turtles. The first year nesting usually drops and then after that it, it comes back up. So it's it's better to have that project than it would be have a seawall where there's no way for turtles to nest. Uh, and so that's just one of the things that has to change. Um, Unfortunately, sometimes in those near shore habitats, sand moves a lot and it may cover up that reef. They try to mitigate that by putting in some artificial reefs. I um, mean, that's just something that that we have to deal with. It's it's not perfect conservation, but it's it's, it's what we have um, to keep things going in the right direction. Absolutely. I think just more people were concerned, like they're starting it literally right when turtle season, nesting season. Yeah. Is. So it's like, yeah. why didn't you do it during the off season? So, yeah. so it, it's tough because, right, because nesting season runs through 
through October. They mm -hmm. have to mobilize, get everything down here, get all, all taken care of. They usually don't like to do it in the middle of winter because then all that sand they pump on is going to wash Actually, out, yeah. wash away. Um, however, nesting season starts slowly and any of those projects have a significant amount of environmental monitoring associated with them. So there are sea turtle biologists that are going out there at night. Um, our organization is actually doing that for a project up where we're at right now um, and going out to locate those nests. If they would be impacted by the project, they may be relocated to somewhere safe or they may just be roped off so that no construction deals with it. So they, that, that is that is happening. They are making sure that that's all taken care of. Awesome. Um, with the turtles that you guys have done um, tagging with, do you ever see them go back and forth from here into the Bahamas? Um, we do. Um, we definitely have like our loggerhead turtles, a, a large portion, just based on diet alone. Um, they've done some stuff with some some tissue analysis looking at diet showed that a lot of our lock or a good portion of loggerheads in South Florida um, as adults hang out in the Bahamas and then make that journey over here. Okay. And then um, what have you guys, um, or maybe you guys don't do uh, leatherback trackings, but I mean, where are the leatherbacks coming from? So the leatherbacks, they're, they're pretty impressive. So our leatherbacks that are laying on our beaches are traveling the whole way up to Nova Scotia. Wow. So they're going to Hoi Pinos, Nova Scotia. It's cold up there. They're going after big jellyfish. They're eating up there. And then they're turning around and coming back. Now, I said that typically it's every two to three years to make this journey. Um, there was one that was satellite tracked last summer that's already returned this summer mm -hmm. or this spring. It's already back in Florida waters. Wow. Um, so sometimes they, they're able to turn around a lot quicker than that. Yeah. But, um, yeah, they're typically hanging out um, in the North Atlantic. Um, and then in between nesting, they, they leave like South Florida and swim up to Cape Canaveral for a week and then swim back. So they're just, they're swimming all over the place. <laughs> they're all over. And if we're lucky as divers, we get to see one underwater. Uh, if you've seen a leatherback underwater, type in the comments section, the little me emoji. <laughs> we want to know. Um, so since we were talking about their movements, um, when they're not nesting, do these turtles come up onto the beaches at all? Uh, I know in like Hawaii, because I worked over there, we would see green sea turtles come up and lay and, you know, kind of bask yeah. in the sun there. But I don't think they do that here in Florida, right? They don't do that here in Florida. Historically, like in the Grand, in Grand Cayman, they used to before they were all fished out, like in the 1800s. There's, there's stories that the, the sailors talk about. They used to bask. They don't typically do that in in the Atlantic anymore. Mm -hmm. um, however, we have had instances of little green turtles being chased out of the water by a shark in the shallows oh, gosh. And, crawl and crawling up the beach. And there's this tiny little track and this little tired green turtle sitting on, on, on the sand. Um, and sometimes you actually see it go up and then back down. Uh, it's rare, but it happens. Mm -hmm. um, this is a question uh, that came up. Do, do you ever see them travel in like groups or pairs? Are, or are they just solitary animals? So it's really interesting with green turtles, right? Because green turtles, we typically think of them as kind of being solitary, but they're not. Um, green turtles, like think of them as the like buffalo or bison of the ocean. You know, you have you, historically there were thousands, hundreds of thousands of them in these areas. And they would graze across these gigantic meadows of seagrass. And so they do hang out in the same areas. Um, and we do see them, they'll actually kind of follow each other around because it's it's an anti-predator mechanism possibly, or it helps them find food. So if you have a buddy, you know, it's another set of eyes to, to help you keep an eye out for, you know, sharks, but also if somebody else finds something good, you can kind of kind of steal that spot from them as well. <laughs> That's awesome. I, you know, I just thinking when I asked this question, the, uh, the movie uh, Finding Nemo and how the turtle crush and all of his buddies are on the current together. And I was like, I don't think they do that here. Yeah, they, yeah, not, not as family is like that. No, it's, it's, they, they don't, they don't travel like that. It is really interesting. Some of the, the genetic work that they've been able to actually do on turtles up in the North of the, like in Georgia and the Carolinas shows that there are actually like three or four generations of, of females laying on the beach near each other at the same time. So like a grandmother, a mother and a, and a daughter all wow. coming up. Yeah. And, and the, the maternity, the genetic um, lineage has been tied to that. So that's pretty impressive. And then I know we had a presentation before COVID. We never did Facebook live um, 
with a uh, researcher, uh, Boris Tizak. I hope I said his name right. And he was doing uh, the temperature. So he was saying something about if the sand temperature, you'll get your different sexes. So so what is that? It's it. Boys are cold. So it's um, it's hot chicks and cool dudes is the way hot I remember. Chicks cool hot dudes. chicks and cool dudes. <laughs> That's how it works in sea turtles. It's the opposite in alligators. Um, but yeah, so basically warmer temperatures produce females, cooler temperatures produce males. Um, the thing is with uh, increasing temperatures in cl the climate in South Florida, uh, we're producing primarily females and not a lot of males. Yeah. And so there have been some methods that either shade, they don't do it here, but shade, shade nests to keep it cooler. Also increased moisture in the nest. So if you like literally put a sprinkler over the nest or like and keep it yeah. cool, um, that produces more males. Um, so they're looking at ways that they can do that. Um, mm -hmm. However, uh, right now, that's that's something that FAU, uh, Dr. Jeanette Wynikin, is, is a big, big uh, proponent of studying that and trying to look at that over the long term. Yeah. Um, when you were talking about Gumbo Limbo not being a center, will Jeanette Wynikin's lab still stay there or you don't know? Yeah, Jeanette's, Jeanette's okay. Um, they're there. They're, that's just a facility that's leased through there. Right now, Gumbo Limbo, again, it's literally coming out in, in the paper as we speak. I'm getting emails from Fish and Wildlife saying, hey, you know, you guys can't do X, Y, and Z because they don't have a permit anymore. Okay. Um, so yeah, right now the rehab facility is shut down. They don't have any turtles on site because they don't have anybody that's qualified to maintain that. What happens in the future? I don't know. Right. Um, it's, it's unfortunate. I actually, in however many years ago when they started that facility, I actually helped literally build it. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm bummed to see that that's not we are too, because yeah. 4C, we're a huge supporter. We always go to Sea Turtle Day every year, and uh, they didn't have it this year. No, they didn't have it this year. Yep, and then so. uh, and we've always, you know, donated and done fundraisers. So, yep, mm -hmm. it is unfortunate. Um, but uh, somebody um, as was asking, uh, talking about rehabbing these sea turtles. Um, going back to the sea turtles with the, um, oh my gosh, the papillomas. Mm -hmm. Uh, can they're asking, can they uh, recover from this? Can they get released again? Um, is this something that you guys can intervene and give them some kind of a medication or surgery to get rid of those viruses? Yeah, no, it's great. So it's a virus. So it's just like with you and I, like you can't, like, um, there's, there's no antibiotic to get rid of it. You, once you, once you have it or you're exposed to it, like, you know, your body either takes care of it or it doesn't, um, they, they can regress and they're seeing that a, a lot of them do, um, regress. Mm -hmm. Um, some turtles obviously don't make it for, for whatever reason. Um, but a lot of the turtles are, they get the disease do they do grow out of it basically mm -hmm. as they get older and they get bigger and stronger, they're able to get past it. Um, and green turtle numbers in the state of Florida are increasing. So hopefully that gives us hope that, that most of the turtles are surviving and able to reach, you know, maturity, um, and, and get past it. But it is something that we do see a lot of turtles get and it's, it's, it's pretty intense when a, when a turtle has it severely. Yeah. I know um, I did a, a year before I moved here to Florida, everybody. I used to work and be a dive instructor boat captain in Hawaii over on uh, Oahu. And we'd get um, sea turtles and we'd um, help the the sea turtle research people there, um, rehabbers. And we would catch the turtles and they would actually like remove the papillomas. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as long as they weren't internal, like yeah. down in their throats, they mm -hmm. could survive if they removed them. But that didn't mean that they couldn't get them again. Exactly. That, um, you know, they would try and get them off, then mm -hmm. take them and send them back to the ocean. But if they had them internally, it was a lot harder to rehab. Yeah. And get yeah, them if, they, if, you, if they have them internally, generally the rule is that they, the animal is euthanized. Mm -hmm. um, if they're external only, then they, they do surgeries for them. They're highly vascularized. So they have to use like a cauterizing laser to cut them off. Um, and again, Gumbo Limbo was doing that Brevard Zoo, Sea Turtle Hospital down in Marathon, a couple other facilities are, are doing it with, with some success. But again, then they, they can grow back. Yeah. Uh, and we've seen that happen. So you have to get everything else right first and then get rid of the tumor. Yep. Awesome. So a lot of people are wanting to know, how do we volunteer with you guys? How do you volunteer with us? That's really tough. Um, it's it's between the the permits and kind of boat space. And our, our, our main project, which I didn't even talk about on this, um, is actually monitoring for turtles at a nuclear power plant in Hutchinson Island. Um, and so it's really hard for us to take volunteers. Um, right now, honestly, the best thing to do is to kind of be you know, spokespeople for, for conservation. If you see something out there 
um, let us know, um, you know, kind of pass the word, follow us on, on social media, that, that sort of thing. We're always, you know, always looking to know where the next, where, where turtles are, if there's interesting behavior, that sort of thing. So, um, just kind of keep in touch and, um, let us know what's going on. Also, if you are a school teacher, right, you guys yep. can, uh, that's a way to volunteer by getting the, one of their programs, uh, instated into one of your classes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all that information is on our website. Again, it's all free. Uh, we have the the education programs. Uh, we have we run them out of Martin and St. Lucie counties, but we have partners that have all the materials, um, basically, in most a lot of the coastal counties in in Florida. Um, so those can be found uh, pretty easily. Awesome. Well, guys, uh, as you can see on the screen, this is our website. If you go over to the event tab, you're going to find some cool stuff like the. Uh, sea turtle month page if you click here it's going to take you on over and you can learn about ways to help sea turtles here locally um, you can take the sea turtle ecology course that's next weekend um, the 25th uh, we also have bowling for turtles it's our annual fundraiser uh, if you like turtles and you like helping them come out and bowl a few games and have fun with some other divers and also we have our sea turtle swag you can buy online or in stores uh, go into our event page and down below here, um, this is all the stuff that you need to know about what we're doing. All right. So there's that Sea Turtle Ecology course. We have the party on Saturday and then we have another Sea Turtle presentation, but this is going to be at the Fort Lauderdale store. This is not going to be on Facebook Live. This is in person at our Fort Lauderdale store. So if you want to check out uh, more about sea turtles and learn about the nesting, uh, you can go ahead and show up on what day is that? March 21st. So, and there's the Bowling for Turtles link. All right, guys. So, like I said, I was going to go ahead and raffle off a couple of t shirts, some 4C sea turtle t shirts. So, there's everyone's names in the random name picker. And I'm going to go ahead and draw the first name. Oh boy, what just happened? I don't know what just happened. Hold on. Let's try this again. Random name picker. Here we go. And the winner is Bobby Lyon. Bobby, you are our winner. I will email you and give you the information about how to claim your free 4C Sea Turtle t-shirt. Awesome. All right, we got one more t-shirt to raffle off. Da -da 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 -da. And the winner is... Nope, we can't give two to Bobby. <laughs> Let's try that again. How did that happen? Oh, boy. There we go. Alexis Trevino. Alexis, you are our second winner for a 4C Sea Turtle t-shirt. So, guys, just come into the store. Um, show them the email that I'm going to send to you after I'm done with this presentation, and they'll hook you up with a Sea Turtle t-shirt and wear it. Get, take pictures with it, um, post them and tag us on social media. Also tag in water research, um, because they want to see your guys' support too. So, um, all right, well guys, that is it. Uh, thank you so much, Cody, for this fantastic presentation. Learned a lot. Uh, and I think a lot of the divers here have a lot more knowledge about sea turtles in our local area. So thank you. And, uh, thank you to your full team, uh, for supporting sea turtles. Thank you guys for having me. Um, I noticed some some friends in the chat, so some people I haven't haven't seen names of in a while. So I definitely have to reach out and, and catch up. So it was great that you guys all attended. I appreciate it. Excellent. All right, guys. Hope to see you on Saturday at our Boynton Beach Four C celebration, our one year anniversary, and we'll see you guys soon. Bye. Okay.